Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's the session. And today we have a very special guest, the one and only Christopher Randall Graham from a little homebrew shop you might know as morebeer.com. Chris, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a while. Now, you are not a professional brewery, <laughs> which is normally what we do here. But, you know, for those of you tuning in for the last year or so, uh, we are started from homebrewers. We are all homebrewers here. Uh, and I wanted to get Chris on the line here to talk about what is going on in homebrewing in general, because I sure as hell don't know. There's a lot of resurgence in homebrew. There's a lot of interest in homebrewing. So I do want to talk to him about that. But before we jump into that, Chris and his business partner, Olin, did a really cool thing. They, they brewed outdoors and that's all I really know. I don't know anything more about it because just already that, that concept is foreign to me going outside. I just don't, I've never even heard of what that, I don't even know what the definition of that. So I want to talk to you, Chris, a little bit about that, about your hike, about brewing outdoors and how you did it, because I think it is something that's pretty interesting. I know you guys have done it before, or at least Olin has you chickened out, I think is the story in the last time. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I want to, you know, I want to share that with everybody and see maybe someone else wants to do it too. Exactly how you guys did it, or maybe you can give them a jumping off point, any hikers out there. Um, so let's just get into it, man. What did you guys do? Where did you brew? Well, we brewed at the highest altitude in the lower 48 states, brewed on top of Mount Whitney at 14,505 feet. Wow. Where is Mount Whitney? I feel like I've never heard of it. It's in California, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, playing a little bit. Like we used to, to try to like, uh, I know the Boy Scouts when I was in Scouts, we used to have like, oh, this troop is climbing Whitney or whatever, like doing some. I was like, I don't want to. No. So when we went to the desert and brewed, you were there. I, I have a great there. picture from that. And uh, we drove kind of by it. If oh, okay. Yeah. It's a Lone Pine, uh, Bishop, any of those like inland cities in California, those are all kind of like feeder areas that people go before they hike up. Oh, okay. All right. To find their Sherpas or whatever. I imagine it's exactly, a cool thing. Exactly. Okay. I think I would rather go to the lowest point into, into the Death Valley, where we did the Death Valley, uh, than climb. Did you use the internet when you found out about the Death Valley? <laughs> I really did. The, the wireless Fi is what is really what I do about it. Well, that's cool. So, and Olin and I think Regan did it before, right? Yeah, no. So it was uh, yeah. August of 98 that they did it. Um, and back then there were, the internet wasn't so powerful. So there was this email group, um, uh, the H, uh, was it HBD? Uh, and it was a daily oh. digest of emails that would go yeah. out. Wow, I forgot about that. And there was some people from Colorado like, hey, we're going up to this 14, they call them 14 ers We're going up to this 14er and brew, like we'll be up, way up here. So then a bunch of Californians, uh, mainly Olin and this guy, Mike, down in Southern California are like, well, we have Mount Whitney. We have the highest peak. So let's plan a trip. So they did. And a bunch of people said they were going to go and quickly as soon as they learned that they actually had to exert energy that that big group narrowed down to four of them yeah. um and uh regan being one of them and uh interesting to say is i'm now pretty much the age regan was um when no. talked to me yeah that's what olin told me i'm like no that can't be he was wow. ridden hard and put away wet jason so it's a little <laughs> different. yeah he's very moldy he got um that's that's weird to me, man, because I was working there about that time. You yeah, were a little, little bit, bit after. You were about two years after. So it was 98 yeah. when I first started. I, I quit my job, heading down from Boise, Idaho. And while I'm doing that and I get into town, Olin and Regan have taken off for the weekend to go brew down in Whitney. So there's this girl telling me what to do all around the uh, homebrew shop. <laughs> and you can only guess who that is. And uh, you that was my welcome to more beer. Yeah, wow, it sounds uh, oddly familiar. Um, yeah, it. Uh, yeah, telling you what to do is pretty pretty accurate. Um, well, and that's what I mean. Like even then, when when I joined uh, ninety nine two thousand, Regan was already like in his late eighties. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that man will like stand the test of time. 
You know what I mean? It it would be the cockroaches, plastic in the ocean, and then Regan uh, sitting somewhere figuring how to fashion a coconut into like uh, some some of companionship. Him and uh, Keith Richards will be hanging out. (laughs) That's true. They'll be teaching Keith a thing or two. Well, so you missed out your chance the first time. Um, How did you get up to to go about uh, getting back up there? So when we hit the 25th anniversary, we were just talking about just different ideas of fun things to do. We did some stuff internally that was fun for employees and such. We did some giveaways as a company to customers and, and you know, had some fun there. Um, it was during COVID, so it was a little weird that way, but, but had to celebrate nonetheless. But one of the things we're like, hey, we should redo this brew. Um, and... Uh, you know, I just kind of said, yeah, well, and that sounds great. Um, let me know when it's going to happen. And I know to go on Whitney, you have to enter a lottery. And they only choose the lottery winners once a year. Um, and you put in like three sets of dates and so forth and so on. So last February, he's like, hey, we won the lottery. We're going to climb Mount Whitney. And I'm like, hey, okay. yeah, you won the lottery. <gasps> We're climbing Mount Whitney. Oh, <laughs> and and for those of you who don't know, my business partner Olin is in fantastic shape. He's uh what a year year and a half older than me, something like that, but is in twice as good a shape as I am. Has a Peloton, both uh, a bike and a runner, and he and I then go to the gym once in a while at lunch here. And if I don't go, he still goes anyway. And um, I'm I'm. I'm a dad. Well, he's a dad too, but uh <laughs> it's funny because every excuse you could make to not being in shape, Olin just sort of ticks those boxes anyway. Oh, yeah. that's, that's just Olin, like super competitive in like a really positive way, you know, not like an angry competitor, but just like a very positive, like goal oriented competitor. And he's like, it sounds like he's just never lost his edge. No. And so, he's, you know, it's like, Hey, we're going to be going in uh what was it Sept- uh, august or something like that i'm like oh okay it's february like i don't even own hiking boots and how is this gonna happen and and all of that good job that's exactly what i would wonder about too because you know i've been on a couple long hikes I did like a 50 miler in scouts and it was tough man and that shit was brutal but i had the luxury of training for you know quote unquote training like walking 10 miles in one day distance like training but you know, on this hike, I forget what it was, but it was, um, we did a, a mile, no, um, a th- the hell was it? Yeah, a mile, uh, no, a thousand feet ev- elevation in a mile. So it's like 45 yeah. degree, you know, switchbacks and you're like, you can't train for that. So how do you train for something going up 14,000 feet, hauling equipment that you don't need? So, well, like, you brewing. need in order to brew. Right. So, right. so, uh, I start reading like, what's this hike? You know, just going on the interwebs and and looking up hiking uh, Mount Whitney. And, you know, you start to learn like, okay, there's multiple ways to go. You can go the John Muir way. You can go the traditional way, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I start reading. I'm like, oh, what do we have the um, permit for? He's like, oh, just the the, the cool, I don't want to say easy because it's not easy, but the, the, the base one that everyone wants to do. And that is you, you pull into Whitney Portal, and a lot of people will leave at four in the morning and just do it in one day. They, that way they don't have to wear much of a pack. Um, and you're kind of up and down on the same day. You're hiking 22 miles or something like that that day uh, and going at a brutal altitude change. But you don't have to wear a big heavy pack. You don't have to sleep, you know, tents and all that. So we're looking at that, but we're saying like, okay, we're going to do that hike. We're going to camp at what they call high camp. Um, and that way we can leave the tent, sleeping bags, cookware, anything like that, that we don't need for brewing there, go up the next morning, brew, then come back and either decide to pack it all in and hike down or spend another night and hike down. Either way, you're talking a two, maybe three day trip at best, 22 miles. Even I can do that. Easy. Uh, yeah, so I buy a pair of hiking boots on Amazon, you know, the greatest place to buy hiking boots, but it's oh yeah. We're like peak COVID, like it's nothing easy to get to or or go into around here. Um and so I wear hi- the hiking boots the first day and I get blisters the first day 
you know, and I'm wearing the hike boots here at work. Like it's not like say, I'm, you didn't break them in, but it's not okay. So you got blisters the first day from b- trying to break them in. Exactly. Okay. All right. And I'm like, I, I haven't I actually at that point I hadn't. <laughs> this is gonna sound really bad. But I hadn't worn shoes like to work for a long periods of time that actually have these things called laces on them <laughs> for several years. Okay. Everything's slipping. I'm getting old. It's You're a Velcro slipping. man. I get it. That's cool. You are yeah. turning to Regan. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so it's like, oh, my feet weren't quite used to ankle support. And like, that's where I really got most of the chafing and such. So anyway, long story short, those broke in in a few days. And the, those were pretty good. So that was my main training was that. Was walking. Then, All right. <laughs> we're like two weeks away from the trip. And Olin's like, well, we should probably train. I'm like, oh, okay. So at lunch, we start doing a two mile hike here or there, like uh, New Maloney's State Park and stuff like that. And then he goes away for a week uh, for a family trip up to Tahoe. I'm like that bastard, he's up at elevation. He's, you know, probably having fun outside. I'm sitting here at work. But uh, as I start going, well, we should probably be a little more prepared. So I, you know, we have the brew room here. So I'm like, let's make a test batch. So I read all the old docs that they had on what they did. And I say docs, it's a, the, still on our website, um, a brewing at Mount Whitney. And it's, you know, it's, it's a plastic bucket. And I'm like, well, we, we got to kind of step it up a notch and go with a little more modern. Um, so I brew three or four times. Well, I set out to brew once but it takes me a few times to get started when i realize you know you're not bringing a camp chef cooker you're not bringing like a 20 pound (laughs) propane tank sure um so head over to rei buy some camping uh based stoves and and such and so i start brewing and, and finally i get it to where i do a gallon batch um and you know pretty cool got the times down trying to keep it short And the big reason for that is you don't want to be on the peak of that mountain very long. Storms come through like unpredicted. And if lightning hits, you better get the the heck out of there quick. Um, So trying to get it to a two hour brew day, that's my goal. Um, And I know that's not, you know, a traditional time, but I, well, I don't know if you remember Jason, when Olin first had kids, he started like to, in order to keep brewing, he started experimenting with like 15 minute mash time. So what's the efficiency difference? Uh, 20 minute boils and what's the flavor profile like and such. And so I took some of those wins from that and said like, yes, you need more grain, but you could do a, a 20 minute mash and still get good, decent enough efficiency and such. So built the whole thing, had it all down, like, you know, so I could set timers because I was just going to be relaxed and clear minded after I climbed up there and just. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Nothing to worry about. Yeah, for sure. But at least I wrote it down on a checklist, you know, blah, 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 blah. So and then I rented uh, uh, Sports Basement has this cool deal where you can rent backpacks and all this stuff. Because I'm like, I'm not going to go spend thousands of dollars for this one hike. So you can rent everything you need for the most part in terms of backpacks, bear bags or bear bins and, and sleeping bags and tents and all that for like 200 bucks. And so That's it's like, okay. good. But the thought of a rented sleeping bag bothers me. Oh, come on. During COVID, just get in there, rub your face a little bit. I still uh, have my sleeping bag that I had in scouts doing my 50 miler. I bet you had your pillowcase with you too. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so I got it all, got that like lined up and rented. Olin gets back from his trip. He's like, we have that trip next week. Like, we better get ready. I'm like, dude, I've been like stressing out about this. So I start going over like, okay, here's what I've got prepared. He's like, oh, okay, we're looking pretty good. Then we get into to print the permit and find out everything we need to do. And the, because you go through recreation.gov to do this. It's It's not like, its All own right. system and uh unfortunately they had like some weird error message and so we call up and they're like oh yeah the, your 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 lottery's canceled Whoa. and we're like can we know why and and i don't know that we fully know why yet and that's or, or ever will but that's fine but anyway the we're like well and Olin's like well we did a lot of plans we, you know um the guy's like okay there are other ways to go you know look up online cottonwood lake 
and, and you can hike in from that way. And you don't need this special permit. You need a permit, but you don't need this special one um, to go through. So okay. I start, we both start going through and, and learning about it. And we, we set it up and we're like, oh, thank God. So we set it out a few weeks. And this way, now we can really plan <laughs> and start training. And we started doing that on the weekends. <laughs> like, but it's, it's, you know, you go from a 20 mile hike to a minimum of 40 mile hike. So it definitely changes the dynamics of what you're going to be doing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mentally too. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Can, can I handle this? You know, I'm reading <laughs> these stories and, and I guess altitude sickness is like seasickness and that it's like, it, it does, it's not like a sign of manliness or not, if you are or not, it's like my dad sailed for years and then we get randomly seasick once in a while. And it's like, that just happens. And yeah. altitude sickness is like that too. This one guide who'd brought up, I don't know, 30 or 40 times had brought people up to the top of Mount Whitney, only got altitude sickness twice, but it's like, it, it can happen to anyone at any time. So I'm, you know, put that in the back of the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, you're just worried about things you can't control. Right. Um, when did you become anyway, like me? <laughs> as we get closer you know, we do the right things. We make a doc. We start like, okay, what do we need? What, how are we going to do this? What's the route we're going to take? And we were able to get our permit, wilderness permits for those areas and, and those camping spots. And you think they're going to be like camping spots. Like, yeah, like where we're used to camping. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all the planning stuff. But now we're going to be going this like new route and with new routes or new opportunities. And um Ola and I both like fly fishing or love fly fishing. And so one of the things I was looking at, we were looking at these lakes <clears throat> and Googling them and reading it, and they're above 11,000 feet. And <clears throat> the California state fish is the golden trout and they only live above 11,000 feet and they happen to live in those lakes. Oh, uh, okay. So we start going, well, you know, we got to bring fly rods and, and uh, such. Uh, so, you know, and then as you get closer and closer, I, I took all my brewing stuff and I started weighing them on a gram scale and writing the weight on everything going, that's way too much. Like, and, you know, you start cutting down on, on things and I don't need two lighters. One, one is just fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. That stainless stirring spoon is way too heavy because you start figuring out like how much this backpack's going to weigh, how much this is going to weigh, how much is that going to weigh. And it and, all adds up very quickly. It adds up very quickly. And then throw in a fly rod, a reel, um, you know, some flies, some extra gear, you, you, you know, want to have enough. Um, so we're like, cool. That, that's like the new awesomeness that we get to explore this trip as opposed to prior trips. And this trip, we're kind of going in the way John Muir went up to Mount Whitney all those years ago. With a uh, fly rod and a white gas stove. And a, oh, well, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> state-of-the-art backpacks and whatnot. Yeah. Well, no, that is cool because it, it does sort of make you slow down and, and enjoy the trip rather than let's bust, let's bust it to get up there, do the thing, and then we got to get back because we, you know, we both have stuff to do. Exactly. Um, that, you know? And it's funny because when we first were doing the other trip, it was like, well, you know, on Sunday is my last day I can get home because I got these things with the kids and, and him the same. And like, you know, it became this like, we just got to hammer this out. We're going to brew, hammer it out, and get home. And this, we're like, no, no, no. Now we're fishing. And now we're... now it's a vacation. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. We're, well, working. we're working, Jason. Well, my well, wife might listen to this show. And... <laughs> Amy, was a, it was a working vacation. A Amy won't listen to the show, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so it all comes way too quick. You know, we're working, we're doing our regular things. We're trying to run this business and trying to take care of our people and customers. And we're still in COVID and we're still like an office that used to have 40 some odd people in it now has two of us. Um, and I still have VPN servers and everything that everyone's working at home. Um, so the IT department is going on top of my way. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always, I feel a, a good thing. You put your eggs in one basket and then put that basket in the campground for four days. Well, and I, I look like up, uh, cell coverage and apparently there is about this much through most of it. Oh, okay. And so right. I look into renting a satellite phone and it turns out those are ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but our friend Brad Allen let me borrow his, um, 
uh, satellite walkie talkie with presets in it. So I could like let our wives know that we're okay twice a day. Right. Um, right. And that was cool. But we get close. We're, we're getting up to the day. We're going to go getting nervous. Um, I got my test stuff, got all my grains packed up, got my hops pre-measured, got my checklist, got my kettle, got all that. I'm like, all right, Olin, you're going to have to take some of this. And we, we split it all up. And we finally get to go to Sports Basement to pick up our stuff, which I'm thinking it's going to be like brand new stuff. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this is a well-worn, well-hiked uh, stuff, which is fine, uh, but not the latest, latest, greatest. So all of a sudden, the weight estimates, we're thinking we're going to have like mid-40 packs weight-wise. And then we start loading everything in there. And the first time I put my pack on the scale is about like 58 pounds. Oh. Like, well, I don't need that many pairs of socks. I don't need that many pairs of shirts. I don't need, you know, you just start, the non-essentials start going out. Yeah, and especially when you're, when you're planning for a, 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 like a true backpack experience, you don't think that like socks are going to weigh that much, but they are sort of like, those things are the, for your shirts, for sure. I don't need, I need one, one shirt, maybe two or whatever. Cause it doesn't, but it doesn't feel that way. It's still like, it's very weird. It's, it's, yeah, it's almost like a Sophie's choice, I guess, in a way of like, what are you going to throw out food or your clothes? Well, the other thing is all your stuff has to go in these bear bins and they're like hard plastic jugs with like a lid that you screw on and you screw them past this like little tamper proof part that a bear can't undo. So I looked at that. I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm 225 pounds. I like to eat. Um, and <laughs> like four days. That's a long time, maybe five, because you got to always have that, like, what if something goes wrong? Um, and all this dehydrated junk. Uh, but I started throwing away some of that, like, okay, it's not going to not gonna do that. Um, so long story short, whittled it down to about 50 some odd pounds. Um, reasonable, and, dude, reasonable. And then the last thing we realized is where we're starting is not where we're parking the car. So you need a shuttle. You need someone to like drive you from where you're going to park your car to um, to where you're going to start your hike. And so I think this is going to be like, oh, we'll Uber it. Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I live in a city. <laughs> so I, I start Googling it. And I'm like, oh, God. So I call. Nope, I'm fully booked that date. Nope, I'm fully booked that date. Nope, I'm fully booked that day. And finally, <laughs> do you have any recommendations? Yeah, try Lone Pine Kurt. I'm like, it's really his name. That's how I'm going to find him. Like, yep, Google it. Boom. Lone Pine Kurt at AOL.com makes okay. you feel real, real confident in this. Yeah. He sets it up. He's like, I got a morning shuttle, but I can do the afternoon shuttle and it'll be about this time. I'm like, well, we'll take what we can get. Um, Cause I haven't really, I've let Olin kind of plan like, where are we camping and hiking? Um, and so Lone Pine Kurt picks us up great car ride with them it's like 30 minutes of driving through the middle of nowhere up a ridge line and uh he drops you off and you're like i sure hope this is the start of the trail because everything i've looked at is a map um right. i honestly thought we were going to be walking through pristine meadows and such i had no idea what i was getting myself into <laughs> um and so day one <laughs> we, we puts us in at horseshoe meadow anyone who's knows where we are and uh we're gonna go to rock creek campground i guess most people would stop at this one lake that's a couple of miles away mm -hmm. and i we're, we're not about a couple of miles we're, we're we're trying to get to where we can go fishing and so right. uh, so he's like i think we could do it and you know i think it's like nine miles or so looking at the map or whatever so we set out hiking uh 12 30 in the afternoon hot um packs are heavy we're, we're cruising we're going fast because it's like we don't we're not quite sure how far we're going turns out we went 13.42 miles that day <laughs> yeah. gaining uh, uh 1500 feet um in about six and a half hours and we started going faster towards the end um uh, because it was getting dark we're like, yeah. well we got to get to that campground um that's pretty good though man 13 miles in six hours yeah, you were you were huffing it yeah we were doing huffing. like 24 minute miles or so i think is what that that um goes down to i think that day olin fell twice 
um, like full on turtled. Um, I wasn't even around him. So if he had hurt himself, I don't know what we would have done because we tended to just kind of take off and just get in your own head and walk for a while and then catch up with each other. And I was ahead of him. So that would have been bad. Yeah. Um, but then I started getting like looking at my hands and it's like, I closed my fist and my hand was real tight. I'm like, what is that about? And it's like, oh, that, I guess that's part of one of the things of if you're having a little bit of um, altitude, you, you swell a little bit. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm like, ah, I read about that on the internet. Um, and you know, we're up at like 13,000 feet at this point or somewhere like that. Um, maybe, maybe 11. Um, but anyways, we're getting, and, and we are hiking away. It's starting to get dark. We're both like, God, I hope we find a place soon. We pass this mom and son who are coming the other way towards us, which there's nowhere for 13 miles and it's dark and they're just hiking into the woods. We're like, this is really strange. <laughs> yeah. um, I say son. I say son. He's in his twenties or so, not like a little kid. But uh -huh. I was like, oh, and, and they're like, is there anywhere to camp up there? And I'm like, no. I'm like, well, we'll find a place. I'm like, okay. And and they're like, and they're like, oh, you're not far at all from um, Rock Creek Campground. We're like, oh, sweet. So <laughs> we're hiking along, and all of a sudden, we're, we're both dying at this point. And there's a little stream. I mean, stream. Uh -huh. and five or six guys who are setting up their tents uh, right after it and i'm like hmm kind of thought rock creek campground would be a little bit bigger than this but whatever and right. the guy's like oh hey guys i'm so sorry we're taking up so much space here um you know technically i only had a permit for four guys but we have six um because he's a guide or something long story short we're like whatever we don't care we're exhausted I just want to drink some whiskey, eat some food and go to bed. Right. My, my feet hurt. Um, oh, and, and earlier this summer, I weightlifting, I um, did something to my back, like compressed discs or some crap like that to the point where I have sciatic nerve pain. Nice, dude. You're, you're primed. You're in your prime. Oh yeah. So it's like Brute. my foot, my foot was, has this like electrical feel sometimes. And that mm -hmm. I was starting to get that on the hike. Anyway, we get there. We're like, we don't care. Um, we're just, we found a place, set up tent, make some dinner. Um, and, and by the way, we recorded all this. We're working on our YouTube video and I'll send it over when we have it. Uh, maybe yeah, we can please do. up the show notes and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but well, we do a little thing every night, um, which is kind of fun. Um, especially after a little bit of whiskey because you don't bring beer on that trip. Um, and anyway, go to sleep, wake up in the morning. And I tend to be a pretty early person in the morning. So I kind of scoot out and I go for a walk just because I want to see what's around us, but without my backpack. So I'm delighted. And no less than a half mile away is the real Rock Creek campground. <laughs> Granted, it's not with what it's not like, electric and, and running water and, oh. and and anything like that it's just an open meadow next to a big stream um or creek uh with lots of places to get your water out of and and um places you could tell that people have camped before and, and it is all under protected big redwood trees and whatnot so I like anyway. the 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 so-called guides from the other trip didn't tell you that. That's and that's what I was saying. I'm like, I wonder how much this guide has really done this before. Yeah. Oh, we're no. This is it, guys. I don't know. When they were going all the way to Tuolumne Meadow in like Yosemite, mm -hmm. and it's like a 28 mile backpacking trip. That's I was cool. like that that that's that's not cool like no. uh, there's nothing about that that sounds good but <laughs> no. all their packs were like 38 pounds and i think part of that was that as part of his guide service you he hooks up with like different companies that will help him get food to the right areas to help someone hike it in for dinner type stuff right okay that's cool yeah so they're not carrying 28 days worth of food or that would kill you right off the get-go yeah absolutely so anyway, that's day one, and I'm exhausted just even reliving day one. Um, yeah, I, my my urge would have been like, let's just brew here, <laughs> let's just set up and make beer here, and then we go. 
Let me I have thought about day. that one night, Jason. That's coming up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then we go like, well, look, now we have three days away from our families. We can just hang out. So day two, yeah, we're looking at the map and we're like, look at this, like Crabtree Lake. And what if we went to lower because it looks like it's bigger. And, and I heard fishing reports that it has the bigger fish, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so we're looking at it on the map and there's no real path to it. But there's kind of a general area you're going to. Um, and so uh, we're like, yeah, let, let's just beat path for that. So we wake up in the morning. And what's nice is now we're not um, leaving at 1230 in the afternoon. You leave at eight in the morning and you're like, we have all day to get there. It's not like if something goes wrong, the twisted ankle or, or whatever. Um, but there's no picnic tables to stop at and sit and relax. There's no, nothing like that out in the wilderness. So, the, so you don't end up taking these big breaks, but that's fine. So we hiked 12.65 miles, but we gained uh, 2,400 square feet or square feet, 2,400 <laughs> feet that day. So quite a bit of elevation. Yeah. And like the first four miles of it, five miles was on a path, like easily, clearly marked. Uh, John Muir Trail, which is part of the Pacific Coast Trail at that point. So it was very well laid out, easy to follow. But then we're like, okay, now is where we got to like kind of, we're looking at the map and we got to go to the right here um, in this meadow and there's no real paths. So we just start kind of walking on the side of the meadow. So we know not to walk in the middle. And there's kind of a path and we're not sure if these are like horse paths or if they're wild animal paths, bear paths, whatever, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, so we're following that and then um we're like according to the map th there should be this trail coming up <laughs> so for two miles we're kind of without any markings at all smart nervous uh yeah. <laughs> but it's still middle of the day something goes wrong we can backtrack out of there we hope sure uh, no one ever gets lost in the middle of the day that's a good rule of thumb yeah see yeah <laughs> um, and so long story short, we finally find the trail that we want to be on. Okay. Awesome. This should make it so easy. This should be like final two miles should be cake. Wrong. Uh, final two miles got to the point where, you know, when people stack rocks on top of each other, Yeah. like by a riverbed or whatnot, mm -hmm. I just thought that was a hippie thing to do. I, I, you know, I didn't realize it out on trails. It's a way of marking like, this is part of the trail. Like, you know, you're going in the right area. Yeah. I see one. It was like, whatever. See another one. And then we get to this field of rocks. And I, I shit you not, it is, as far as my eye can see, rocks that are like bigger than I'm trying to make. And that, that crevice all the way down to the ground in between them. So if you slip through, you're probably going to break an ankle or whatnot. Okay. So you're walking on top of them, wearing a huge pack. Um, and the only guiding light you have is when you see a set of stacked rocks, like on the other side going, I just know I need to get there somehow. Yeah. Um, so get there. And then when we get past that spot, all of a sudden we see this lake and it's like, oh, it's just gorgeous. Huge slab of granite straight down into the water on one side. And then the other side and the whole lake is ours. And uh, we hike the, the length of the lake. It's not that big, but a quarter mile or so. Uh -huh. Find the best place to, to set up camp, set up camp. And then we start fishing, catch some fish, eat some fish, cook up some fish. Um, so that was much better than the dehydrated food that we normally ate. Right. Um, and just it was just so like surreal and serene um, and beautiful. Um, but that night as I'm sleeping, I'm just not sleeping well. You're at high altitude, your brain's billion miles a minute thinking about everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like, one, can we fake the lunar landing and, uh, basically just brew at this campsite or something, <laughs> try, right. to, try to pull that one off. Um, but I don't know what the top looks like. I have no idea, uh, uh -huh. versus what we're sitting in. Um, I'm sure. It doesn't look like a lake. Well, I didn't mean like wide angle views. I yeah. like, oh, sure. Okay. But then I'm like, why did I choose one gallon? You know, because I was going through like, we need to collect this much water before we go. So I'm like, okay, we're going to be adding over 12 pounds to our packs just for brewing water on that summit day, which mm -hmm. is already going to be a hell of a hike anyway. 
like what made me choose you know one gallon um blah 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 so was this morning, was, was that lake where you were p- picking up water to then no no we have one more night of camping after okay, that right. um so i i you know kind of talked to Olin in the morning i'm like dude I, I know this might sound wimpy but I, I i really think we need to make a change of plan and i think he was kind of like well, what are we doing like are we we leaving or i'm like no 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 we're brewing <laughs> but what if we go to a half gallon my that would cut our water weight yeah. from 12 pounds to six pounds he's like you yeah, had me at six pounds <laughs> like, yeah. okay so anyway that was like the the we're not going to fake where we brewed but <laughs> we're, we're going to cut down how much we brew um and the, <laughs> and so it's like okay i could ditch a little grain too and whatnot um and we're still in an area where there's easier places to do that so day three is our easy day we know it's easy we looked on the map we backpacked backtracked through those two miles of like uncharted territory it wasn't nearly as bad when you know kind of you, you you're going to hit this big trail again right like it's a six mile day 1200 foot elevation change um you know three hours or something um get to a, a lake called guitar lake cool little lake but you're just in this like pristine mountains, sheer mountains are all around you. And I'm sitting there like, where is it? Like, where is this mountain? <laughs> you know, like Whitney thing. And Olin's like, I think it's back behind that somewhere or whatnot. Um, Cause he hadn't been from that side either. Right. We're using like our compass on our, our phones. Like, you know, the phone doesn't work, but the compass still works. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, it's there. And we're both like, there how could it be there but it's got to be i mean the compass says it's that way of it so apparently guitar lake is where everybody in the world who's going to summit mount whitney from that side comes before they go up so what started as like four people camping around this lake turned into like the international like fest of people speaking all kinds of languages there had to be 20 groups um everyone sticks to themselves backpackers don't tend to be too social one crazy guy got naked and jumped in the lake yeah. and everybody was like wow you don't see that every day how did you uh, how did you dry off after i didn't look um <laughs> how did you dry it, off it was cold oh yeah. got it yeah uh, <laughs> so anyway uh we go to bed that night with like okay tomorrow's it what do we think we'll wake up for we know we got to get up early i'd ask brad what time he did it because he went from guitar lake up and mm-hmm. they, they started at four and i'm like okay that sounds like a good time to start and you know and i we, we don't we don't eat like badly uh we both like good food so we had fresh roasted coffee uh, a little mocha java uh that we had roasted up for the trip so we made uh we had everything kind of laid out to be able to do everything in the morning yeah. Still thinking we're we're going at like four or something in the morning. At like three something, Olin wakes me up and he's like, dude, look out the your look out the tent, look out the tent. And I can see and we were trying to figure out where the path must be where we hiked the, the day before. But at night, when people are wearing their like high intensity headlamps, you could see the path for the most part. Okay. So, you know of dots going up and i'm like are those stars oh, he's like, nice. no those are headlamps i'm like oh shit that's the path right there that's cool. um, it was pretty far away but so here we are at three in the morning making coffee i you know uh we made oatmeal and and of course uh, Olin throws in like chia seeds and all kinds of fun stuff into uh into the oatmeal to give extra fiber and all that kind of stuff. Sure, yeah, just pick up dirt off the ground and throw it in at that point. And so, I mean, this day is going to be a brutal day. And I already knew, like, the first part of the day is going to be five, a little over five and a half miles and almost 3,000 feet of vertical gain. Um, This is where you're going from 11,500 to 14,505. That's before we brew. Uh, So we head out at, I think, 345 in the morning. to head up there and uh so you know eat as fast as you can throw the backpack on get the headlamp on which mine's not working right so we're trying to figure it out um but you left but you left a lot of gear at was that your base no camp? no 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 this is uh we're not going that way we're going 
up oh. with our gear and coming back the other side with our gear because we're, we're, we didn't come in the way we left. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. There is a spot before the summit that we do leave most of our gear, but okay. it's only like a mile before the true summit. Or, or oh, yeah. At that point, who cares? Well, no. you do. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. But you know what I mean, right? It's yeah. like, oh, well, all right, fine. I mean, I'll take the win, but it's a small win. Yeah. Okay. So when you are at these altitudes, you are no longer allowed to um, bury what might come out. Um, Your poo poo cock duty. Yeah. Okay. So they give you at the start of the hike, and we bought some at REI beforehand, a thing called a wag bag. And if you ever want to look it up, you can, but it's a, it's a little kit. It's really cute. It's green. And uh, it's, you know, one big bag with like a zip top and you open that up and then there's another bag and you unfold that. And then there's little hand wipes and a little bit of toilet paper all in a pretty little bow and it's all biodegradable. Okay. And uh, so we're, we're hiking in the dark on the side of a, a mountain and it's you know a little scary and we get up and <clears throat> around 5:45 we just start seeing the light uh, the sunlight and it's like, Oh, this is awesome. Now I don't need the headlamp. It looks beautiful. So we're cruising up and, and, you know, Olin's flying and I'm a tortoise, like, um, barely making it, but, but about, uh, let's say 14,000 feet or so, the stomach starts rumbling, all this coffee, all this, uh, the chia seeds are coming around, man. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, and we're on a trail that's this wide, but that one side just goes to death. And the other side is like a rock wall straight up. Mm -hmm. uh, you're for the you're most clinging part. to one side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we're, you know, just hiking up along this wall. And I'm like, Olin, it, it's time. And he, of course, is recording and uh, like on his camera recording like, hey, Chris, what's a wag bag? And I'm like, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> and, uh, I will show you right now. Yeah. So uh, I, he did finally eventually move along. And yeah. Everything worked out okay. Everything got into the bag and you have to pack it out of there. You don't just leave it on the trailhead for some cleanup crew because there is no such thing. Right, okay. And uh, Bag bag execution was perfect. It, it worked. It was great, okay. I don't know if perfect's the word, but it-, it, it Yeah, it, see, I'm too sensitive, man. I don't know if I could just use toilet paper. I got a bidet insert, so I'm like, I'm all water all the time. I don't know. Well, I, maybe I can't do this hike. You got to slum it once in a while. So, uh, so, but when I finished, Olin's way ahead of me now. We're kind of hiking up and hiking up. And I know we're getting pretty close to like some pretty good altitude. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I see like a little swimmer across my eye. Um, my fingertips are kind of tingling a little bit. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. Like, calm down. Like, get the heart rate and we're wearing our, we both have Apple watches and we both had them in hike mode, which was great. Cause then you could see your heart rate and most of this heart hike, like leading up to this, we're, we're running 146 to 150 something all the time mm -hmm. and hitting here, I'm hitting one seventies. And I'm like, Oh, I know my, my like, do not go above line somewhere in the one seventies. <laughs> Um, and I'm hiking up and I'm like, yeah, I'd read like, you know, you should know your limits and don't do it if, if you know, you know, you don't want to cause a danger for someone else. Like, um, come and get you or whatever. Yeah, dude. And so I'm getting up, I'm getting up and I'm like, nope, nope. Keep moving one foot after the other and just keep going. And then I finally see Olin and he's at the spot I was talking about where you can dump your packs and hike up, but we can't dump our packs because, or all of it, because we have to have our brewing stuff. Yeah. So I meet him there. I completely lie to him and be like, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, but I tell him a thing because I don't want him to be like, no, maybe we shouldn't do this. I'm not going to be the guy who does this to our team. Right, the, right there. Right, you're right there. Yeah, yeah. well, you're a mile um, and, and uh, some pretty hairy hiking. But, uh, but got to take a little break there, unload backpacks. And Olin is weird in that I'm really – fairly good at hiking downhill i like to let the weight do the work sure and he he can go uphill so he's like let me wear the pack for brewing on the way up and you wear it on the way down i'm like yeah that's great 
So I got like, it was just perfect time for all that. And I was able to breathe deeply, get everything back underneath me, start head up the hill. We, we make it up beautiful views, uh, stunning. Um, get up to the top. There's this hut up there that's been up that the Smithsonian built. And so we were like battling between, do we start brewing or do we check this cool thing out or whatnot? But uh, we get to the very top and all of a sudden we realize there's these like rock made bunkers that people have made over the years. Mm -hmm. So we go down to one of the bunkers and just start pulling out the brewing ing equipment and ingredients. And one of them is a digital thermometer, um, uh, thermo pen. If you, do you have a thermal works? Uh, yeah. I knew well, you were, I have one, I love those, but I, I, I have a little read thermometer. Yeah. Yeah, I have a little pop that I brought with me on the trip. Um, not quite as fast, but it weighs fractions of a pound. Mm -hmm. And so I put it down where we're going to brew and it's 37 degrees. And I was like, ah, when you're in the brew room in Pittsburgh, California at 90 degrees, it's a much different <laughs> brew day than at okay. 37 degrees with the winds blowing on the top of this mountain. So, you know, I had all like, oh, if you make this degree water and you add it into the grains, you should be here based off of what I did, you know, at elevation. And so we started doing that. We get it to 152, but then all of a sudden 152 becomes like 130 or 112, like super quick because of the air temp. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And so we, we had these little Instapot, they're not called Instapots, uh, which I know is a brand, but they're like these little backpacking boilers that are great for like heating up water quickly. You can heat a liter of water in like a, a minute or two. Okay. So I'm like, we're both like decoction time. So we take a, <laughs> a third of the mash out, bring it up to a boil, add it back in. That brings us back up to the mash temp again. And we just, we had to do that four times to hold a 20 minute mash at Jeez. 152. Wow. Uh, then we, we pull the bag out, let that drain and, and get that up to a boil. And we got a boil at 183, I want to say. Um, boil at 183. Okay. Yeah. That's Add cool. our hops and did like a 20 something minute boil. And then cool is that um, Kegland out of Australia had just released like two weeks before this trip, these um, bags that are like multi-layered bags that can handle hot packing. That's what they're designed for. So you go right in at a boil. Um, so that's what we did is we, we went right from the boil kettle through a funnel right into one of these bags um, and just sealed it off, threw it in the backpack, took pictures and all that, was a tourist for like 10, 15 minutes. What do you mean? And, you, that? You, poured it, you poured it in the bag hot. Yep, boiling and, hot. Is there some sort of like mojo that cools it down or it just because it's so cold it's going to cool down anyway we just like we're just going to hot pack and pitch it probably i mean we still have a 11 mile hike to go yeah so let's just get down to like eleven thousand feet to where ten thousand feet whatever we're going down to actually it's eight thousand three hundred twenty seven to be exact <laughs> but let, let's just get down there so that we can um so that we can uh um pitch the yeast and all that jazz and, and, you know, be off this mountain. <laughs> so, rock. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we take our pictures, some guy or gal or team, whatever did like this cool aluminum sign. That's all like, um, water blasted out Mount Whitney, 14,400 with cool graphics and people just leave it up there and everyone takes pictures with it. And, um, and then, uh, then we start hiking out. So, you know, it was a almost six mile hike up and now we got 11, um, miles to go to get down. And so we get back, get our, our bags fully loaded up, um, and just start hiking. And, um, yeah, so, uh, I think we were off the mountain by 9:45 or so, uh, and, and we're cruising down the mountain and all of a sudden, I go, oh, we're pretty far from the peak at this point. We're probably, let's say, noon at this point. So two and a half hours later, we okay. hear thunderstorms and such above you. You can't even see the clouds. There's just the way the wind blows and on these high peaks, these yeah. storms hit it that don't hit anywhere else. Um, and it sounds, you know, like thunder, but you're close to it. So it's pretty damn scary. And I'm glad we got off the mountain by that point. <laughs> right. 
And then we're just hiking downhill through canyons and crevices. And there's a place called a uh, thousand switchbacks. I think a thousand, hundred switchbacks. I think actually now that I say that out loud, loud, but literally <laughs> you remember this from the, your back, your hiking and boy scouts where you just yeah. like this and this, then yeah. this. Well, then this. when you tell a story, make it a thousand switchback. It sounds cool. It sounds cooler. It also sounds like a Kung Fu movie. It felt like a billion switchbacks. At the <laughs> yeah. But we knew, and Brad had told me about it at the, at, at the base where we're getting to where our car is and everything like that. It's this restaurant that uh serves like cheeseburgers and beer and, and stuff like that so you just have this in your head like if we get there in time before they close six o'clock mm -hmm. i get a cheeseburger if i get there after six i get like reconstituted dry food that's called beef stroganoff or something of that nature with sure. some water yeah brown styrofoam and chia seeds from yeah. Owen's uh, personal stack exactly so we made it out and we, we kind of hauled ass. I think we got off the mountain at 4.30. Um, I think we were both just sick of being on the mountain. Absolutely, <laughs> dude. And uh, I, everything hurts at this point. I mean, there's just nothing that doesn't hurt. Hips, from the supporting the backpacks, obviously anything below the waist is all just pressure from, you know, you're going downhill. So the whole weight of the pack is pushing down on your entire spine, mm -hmm. just pushing down on your body and uh, it's brutal. But you you just, ache because you're trying to slow down a little bit and well Olin is like hey you want to take a break and I'm kind of like part of me is like I'd rather keep going because I'm afraid if I stop I don't yes. know if I'm gonna yes. get it. yes absolutely dude yes <laughs> hiking you're sort of you you have to just keep going you're like uh, you're in first gear momentum, I'm go faster but I'm not gonna stop yeah uh, momentum is is there so uh yeah. we make it down there and and bacon cheeseburgers and, and the Modelo, which I know is not oh, something yeah, people get excited about, but I'm not about to drink a big hoppy IPA at this point. Like, <laughs> I, I get excited over Modelo for literally sitting on my couch. So yeah. I can imagine how it tasted after that whole experience. Yeah. So that was pretty much the nutshell. Then, then uh, obviously we pitched our yeast at night. Uh, we stayed at a campground cause it was, you know, still pretty late. We've stayed at a campground even lower, by the um, Upper Owens River, which by the way is world-class fly fishing. So we happened to <laughs> in the morning, just happened to have our rods with us. So uh, yeah. take advantage of that for just a couple hours. And then we don't want to get to home. That's cool, man. What kind of, uh, what style of beer did you make? Or was it even like a thing? It was pale ale, really hoppy pale ale. So we're at 14,500 feet, which is similar to 14.5 Play-Doh, which is 1059 starting gravity yes i'm a nerd yes so that's what i thought you did. this all out okay did you hit those numbers i didn't bring a freaking hydrometer <laughs> i i nailed those numbers in the brew lab okay um but i did not bring a refractometer or a hydrometer i had them both packed and i weighed them both and they both stayed home oh god uh, okay there was no app on your phone or your watch or something like that yeah to, so uh I, you know, uh, we did you know, two row and some crystal and then magnum and citra and mosaic throughout the rest. Mm -hmm. um, so a nice happy pale ale. And then uh, use the uh, Cali yeast, that dry yeast. I love that strain now. Um, and uh, Olin and I got to taste the beer two days ago. Ah, okay. And? Yeah. It was good. You know, it, it's, uh, it was, a uh, bit too hoppy. Um, I went a little too aggressive on how much went in in the last minute of the boil. And okay. I wanted to use a hot bag and Olin didn't. And so it all went in and all went to the fermenter. And so I think it just got a little too aggressive that way. You could definitely taste a great malt profile, but that, that intense um, grassiness of the hops was, was there. We it's also pitched a lot of yeast. Yeah. And so it had a bit of a haze and a bit of a, a little bit of a yeast uh, character to it. Okay. Is that disappointing? No. Okay. I didn't brew. I mean, if I want to drink good home brew, I'll just make it at home. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> I, well, I didn't do this trip with the whole like, oh, I'm, I got to make world-class beer. I'm not going on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's fair, man. I, 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 I guess I would be. I don't know. I guess, I guess it's sort of how my dumb brain misfires where it's like, oh man, I sort of regret, like I should have done this. 
and you sort of like lose the forest for the trees, no pun intended. No, but that, that's the is. beer. That's the last bottle. I'm going to age it for a little bit, but I mean, obviously you don't want to age it too much. Oh, yeah, uh, no, age it, man. What's that? I said age it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, hoppy beer age. Yeah, that's great. So uh, tell me about the, 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 hot, the hot bag or what did you call it? Hot sack? Hot pack. Hop, hop, H-O-P? Hot. Hot, H-O-P. hot pack. What is so it? hot packing? Is, I'm trying to think who first did it. Uh, Dan Listerman was the first guy I knew who did it. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is again HBD days, and he used to do where he would brew, and I really think. And sorry, Dan, if you're you're seeing this, but you know me well enough to know we can have a little fun together. Is <laughs> I think Dan got a little too drunk while brewing, and instead of wanting to finish his beer after the boil, he just put his lid on and would come back the next day where it cooled down get it into his fermenter and pitch the yeast. And he said, most of the time he made good beer that way. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I get a little leery about when people say they made good beer in the late nineties, early two thousands, because I don't feel like anybody really knew well enough. Well, and it's all arbitrary, right? Of uh, <laughs> right. So, so Kegland out of Australia and a couple other places in Australia do it where they hot pack a pro- they'll go to a professional brewery or whatnot, and they'll work on like, hey, we want to take out X amount of these. And the, you probably remember the clear, like opaque, like whitish, uh, 64 pound malt extract mm-hmm. things would get head packs, I think we yeah. call them. Yeah, yeah, head packs. Yeah. They will fill essentially those things that are, are food grade or tolerant of heat. They'll, they'll fill those at a boil, seal them off with no air in them and and label them and put them in shops and, and people will come pick up a, a one and they just bring it home add yeast and they're done um it's pretty common I, it's wild we've been worried about it from a botulism standpoint um yeah and so uh apparently australia botulism doesn't exist no man it's uh <laughs> no it's just a territory they took over um so anyway so so the whole concept though darren does it quite a bit successfully because i've had his beer where he goes into his conicals stainless conicals clean sanitizes them then he he pushes them out with nitrogen then he fills boiling wort in from the bottom and then lets them cool overnight they're fully sealed and in fact he even has a um uh like a it's not just a spunding valve. He has it where he has a nitrogen tank going in at a low pressure. And so it can handle expansion and contraction. So as it cools, it contracts. And he's got a valve on top that only lets nitrogen in. Um, okay. Yeah, I think they used to be for barrels, if you remember the white, yeah, white the, valves that the breather, would... Uh, cask breather. Cask breathers, yeah. uh, things like that. But he's got it set up with, with uh, nitrogen. And so he's you know, pretty well able to make a sealed off vessel, cool it down overnight and pitching the next day. So botulism doesn't stand a chance, um, that kind of stuff. So uh, I started doing it at home, maybe a little faster, but I, I go hot into a stainless conical into a fridge, which I'm, I'm slamming down to like 38 degrees or whatnot for a couple of hours until I get the internal temperature in the 60s and then bringing it back to ale fermentation, pitch my yeast and, and go. And I can usually do that the same day. Mm-hmm. Well, but you're, you're running not, a lot less risk. Yeah. Well, why not just use a, um, a, a wort chiller? Slow. And, and you're, okay. you're usually a little more open. I do use wort chillers too, but hot packing, if you do it right, you're going into something with no air in it. And so the beauty of the hike was we knew we had hours and hours and hours of time and no running water. So there wasn't going to be a wart chiller. There wasn't going to be, um, sometimes there's snow pack up there. Sometimes there's not, mm-hmm. there wasn't when we were up there. So it's, um, sure. So no, I didn't we mean... went into these boil proof bags to bring home. Yeah. No, on the hike, it definitely makes sense, but I was talking like a, on a, on a homebrew level, like, uh, but I guess it's a good way to save water. I mean, you don't need to, if you don't need to do it, if you do it right, if you, if you, if you hot pack the proper way, you don't need a war chiller. Well, I think a lot of people are using these bags too uh, as one-time fermenters. So they're hot packing into them, fermenting in them, transferring out of them, which is its own trick. Uh, and then they're just throwing them away. 
Hmm. It's a plastic bag. Put throw them in the recycle bin. Yeah, throw them in the ocean. That's where they all end up. Just sh- put put them over the turtles' heads and just run and then go away. I put free turtle food on the side before I put it in the recycle bin. Man, that's a Looney Tunes cartoon right there. Uh, that sounds interesting, man. That and uh, I mean, it sounds like they're recyclable, so that's good. Um, okay, interesting. Wow, that's a trip, man. So look at that. If you guys are, are out there, want to brew on the road or do do something cool like that, look up how these hot. Do you guys sell them? I'm oh yeah, the hot hot just hot pack hot bag. pack hot pack bags. Okay. Do you have the recipe for the Whitney trip up in case anybody wants to replicate your super hoppy pale ale? In the uh, in the uh, video, we'll have all that, and and I'm hoping to have the video. Like we've seen the prelims, we did the um, which he's edited down nicely. Joe has, and then we uh, we did the tasting on Tuesday or Monday. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping actually we'll have the final product in the next few days to review and whatnot. Um, and it's nice. It'll just fill everything we just talked about into like 15 minutes. Oh, good. You look <laughs> like Benny Hill hiking up the mountain. Like, <laughs> Sounds good. Um, all right. Hang on, everybody. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to chat more homebrew with Chris from More Beer. Hang on. It's the session. We'll be right back. Hey, glad you're still here. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. It's the session. We're back with Chris Graham from More Beer. You go to morebeer.com. Of course, they bring you this and every session. If you want absolutely everything you need to make great beer at home, you go to morebeer.com. You can also do coffee roasting and wine making and uh, probably something else. I, I don't even, I've never heard of yet because I'm, I'm so out of the loop. But uh, Chris, I want to talk with you about high end home brewing because you've done the shows before where we've, um, uh, what do we call it? brewing on the cheap or brewing like a cheap SOB or whatever it is where it's like you, Here's your brass, you know, everything. And you can just buy at Home Depot because everything's real cheap, which is not the case anymore. Uh, but I wanted to sort of, sort of go on the other side of that. What about high-end home brewing, high-end equipment? Because after all, being in the, the home brew industry, we're all super rich. So we yeah. can all afford it. <laughs> yes, the brewing, you know, brewing is where the money is, folks. Yeah, man, you didn't know that. If you want to get wealthy fast, open a home brew shop. Um, no, it's it's more of like... Uh, I guess what we were talking about just during the break, it's, you know, prices have either come down, but things have been innovating. Uh, people have been innovating in this space for a long time. Just things have shifted, especially since I started home brewing and definitely since you started home brewing because you're way older than me. Um, so, so I just want to talk a little bit about that. Like for those people who have, you know, um, I don't want to say disposable income, but if you're home brewing and you want to get the most for your money, if you want to, you know, really just splurge on stuff, how can you make a big splash jumping into home brewing or even updating your, you know, your old uh, bucket and siphon? What can we do? Say, how can we do some damage? The cool thing is high end brewing in my mind doesn't have to equal high expensive brewing um, as a, a direct corollary. Now there are some things and we'll go over a couple of them today that are pretty expensive, you know, but you're not talking $100,000 um, type stuff. You're talking up to 10000 I mean, unless you want to start a brewery. Um, but, uh, but really, it's more about like convenience. What are the things you hate? What are the things that make this hobby hard sometimes? This is a hobby like any other hobby where people come in, get all excited. The work doesn't bother them um, until it does. Uh, and that that can be the kiss of death for a lot of people is, is yeah. washing bottles for a good amount of people is when they end homebrewing at some point because uh, they never even get past that stage because they hated bottle washing so much. Um, then suddenly kegging became, you know, 20 years ago, kegging was the luxury um, uh, item, high end item, if you will, yeah. comparatively to bottling. Um, True. And now it's sort of the default. Yeah, you know, we call like starter kits with it. Like, yeah, like bottling now, I feel like is sort of just like a a thing you can do, but you don't have to really do it. And it's cleaning the bottles now for me. Cleaning kegs is my like. I don't want to do it. I want a service that'll clean it for me. But okay, so when we were, you know, we were cleaning kegs years ago in the back of a shop, and we yeah. hated it, and we had that wand that would spray everything around the place. <laughs> yeah. Um. 
it was a pain in the ass. And, and then Tasty comes up with this cool little device using a pump and a bucket. And, you know, we all made one um, when he brought it to us. And, you know, he wanted to make a commercial product out of it, but it was so expensive. And you're buying like off the shelf components that we couldn't buy at any kind of wholesale level enough to be able to make a product out of. So it really never went anywhere for years, but it was such a cool product. Now there's, you know, the bucket blaster for $69. There's Mark's keg washer for $99. There's, you know, like three or four different products that all do a very similar thing um, for under a hundred dollars that clean carboys, buckets, kegs, all kinds of stuff with a recirculating pump system. Wow. You can see, so you can buy basically your own keg washer mm -hmm. for home brewing. Yeah. Now keep in mind, we're, we're home brewers. We're not using caustic. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot longer exposure time, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, for under a hundred bucks, people are, yeah. are buying these things to just do a closed recirculation like tasty has been doing for years. Um, I'm okay with like a lot, if it takes me longer, but I have to do less work, I think that's a good trade-off. Well, and, and he's the one who taught us if we were to ever make a commercial product, which we never did on this, but he's like, put a timer on it. He's like, cause I, he would go start a keg or two, mm -hmm. then go back in and go back to work and mm -hmm. then forget about it. And then um, run them dry over like, you know, hours and hours and hours and come back to it and hear this like, low grinding noise where like the pbw is so concentrated that it's like just eating <laughs> the impeller of this pump away nice okay that's cool man i never would have thought i never would have thought that that you know, is it is it that just parts are cheaper or people have figured out how to how to do that well in the last in the last 15 years we've a lot of us, uh, you know, we did a lot of stuff in house, right? Like we mm -hmm. welded, we, we tried to fabricate out of plastic. We tried to fabricate out of metal. We tried to fabricate different things. Colin was always, you know, he was just in my office a couple hours ago and we we're talking about making something else. And it's like, that's our DNA where we want to figure out how to do this. But what simultaneously happened was, you know, people came into the industry outside of the industry who were having stuff made overseas. And the rest of us either were going to die or adapt, you know, um, and and you learn to adapt and you you find these manufacturers, you find how to work with them. And, you know, suddenly you, we have an R&D team who is all skilled at AutoCAD and, you know, different softwares to to build product with. And um, but you have that low cost labor, which, you know, in a way sucks, but also in a way is is driving the ability to have these these low cost innovations um come like i think when we finally parted out what we would do to make uh mike's dream machine it was a 200 hundred dollar keg or uh, carboy washer that looked like it was made in regan's basement <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I think even Mike was like, well, that's just too much. Um, and that's why we didn't make a product out of it. Um, but now you get them and they, they look purpose built and they're under a hundred bucks. And it's like, wow, take a convenience like that. And, and so all of a sudden you start thinking about all the different cool things that we can't, we haven't been able to do. And, but with access to good engineers, good manufacturing, and such all of a sudden is able to be done. So now canning is like a thing homebrewers do. I mean, yeah, this, thing, this thing tripped me the fuck out when I, and I learned about it. I think I actually, I think uh, Olin and I were talking about like just updating the ads or whatever. I think last year and he told me that there's like a homebrew canning thing. I'm like, I, I, I don't know if I can't tell if you're joking <laughs> it, it, because five years ago, that would be just inconceivable. I'm just well, like there's, there's and, always and been the, for the last uh, however many years there's been the October, which is like a good small brewery canning line. Mm -hmm. But then Kegland came out with the cannular, and it's four hundred and something bucks, and it's like holy cow! Like, and it works. Um, and, and what we love working with those guys is, you know, they they take good feedback, and we have a great system of giving them good feedback, and they take their customer feedback, our feedback excuse me and they keep reiterating and it's like 
wow, we're making all of that for that price. So it's not like, oh, I have a canning line. I, I probably shouldn't say his full name, so I'll just say Claudius. Do you remember Claudius? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, he had a canning line or some, maybe it was bottling, I, but it was automated. He built because he had an automation company and he yes. used a lot of our parts to do it. I think, I think he bottle. told me he had about 15 grand worth of parts into this thing. <laughs> You know, and it's like, he's just a home brewer gone wild. Um, yeah. And he's a German and uh, like very particular about what he wanted done and the way he wanted done. But, and it's just like, that's what it was in 1998 and 2003. And, and that, you know, I was at, the, we were at the limitations of what we could figure out how to produce in our small warehouse. Um, so th that's just an example, the, the cleaning thing. And it's the number one thing we all hate, right? Right. It's like, uh, we hate cleaning and it's like, oh, now I can buy not just one thing that I can, you know, it used to be, oh yeah, you could buy a brush. Like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I remember that was a big thing too, trying to figure out the right brush. But now when with a canning system, like do you, now you don't even need to do that. You don't, what are you cleaning kegs for? But I guess you need to put the beer into something, I suppose. Yeah, so. uh, well, cans are sterile yeah. when you get them. So yeah. um, you're not typically cleaning those, but you know, there's other things. You, you, you actually need to carbonate that beer before you can it. So you are going into a keg. So that's a right. different thing. Uh, Let's put carbonation uh, drops in the I want to get technical on this show about how beer is made. I mean, <laughs> no, why don't we, we do that? Yeah, you just get this can of uh, the carbonation drops. You put two in each can and you carbonate that way. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> like bottles? I'm kidding. I mean, so nobody do that. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, now talk, talk high, high end, you know, the mm -hmm. highest ends you can go are like gas and electric brew systems, typically three vessels. We, we have our sculptures there, you know, Blickman's got some nice ones. Spike's got some nice ones. Um, but you're still talking six to 8,000 at the highest end. Um, and, and, it's like, you're still doing the work. You're still, you're getting the control, but you're still doing the work. You're still present. You're still a brewer. It's not like turning itself upside down, dumping all the grain out and you, you walk away and you're done. And, and people still want to solve that one where you just yeah. push a button and you're done. And, you know, we're, we're friends with a guy who's, you know, been on Shark Tank twice now. And, you know, uh, he's got his, his device, but it's like, you're really disjointed from this whole process. You, you know, you, you, you're putting water in a thing and pressing a button and then an app tells you to come back to it. And, you know, that was the cool part of the Pico was you, you kind of had some good controls. You could set like your parameters you wanted, but, and it would run it. So guys like JP couldn't screw up those parts. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much you guys talk about how much you used to swear on the back of our warehouse when you were brewed it. Oh, pro I've, I've probably blocked out much of what has happened, uh, what I used to do at Morbier, but it was, uh, no, I hated fucking home brewing, and I've, I've said that a lot, and what I loved about the Pico Brew is that I can get my day back, you know, yeah. it's like when I first moved to this house, brewed a batch of beer, and then hung Christmas lights, you could never do that, I mean, you could, so, but in that way, you're sort of sacrificing the hands-on, you know, artisanal, the romance of brewing, because you're not adjusting stuff, you know, all that stuff, but it depends on what you value more. Do you value your time? Back then, when I was brewing on the ten gallon system, I just I could sit and do it in my garage. Now I can't. Yeah, I don't have the time. And, and that's it. And so it's like we start thinking like all these things that are like the rubs, the the, the reasons people quit home brewing. And it's like you know, and while some people absolutely love that control, and I know I have in the past. Now I use a simple all in one brewery. I still like all grain. I still love that idea of I turn grains into to wort and into beer as opposed to, you know, rehydrating an extract. Um, but uh, it's like those to me have taken away 90% of the excuses. It's where am I going to store this thing? You know, you store a three vessel system and a frame and all that. It's half your garage. Yeah. Um, and uh, these little all-in-ones, the, the um, Brazilas and the Foundries and the um, Mash and Boil, and there's another one I'm forgetting right now, Grainfather. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and the original, which is the um, Braumeister. Yeah, there's uh, And it's like, these things take up 
I mean, I have mine in a shed and it takes up, you know, this by this in one shelf and that's it. Um, yeah. And I use it all the time now because it's, it's so convenient. It's small enough. I can pick up. I'm not worried about my kids running by it anymore. You know, 20 gallons of boiling wort and my kids running around playing ball was a little bit uh, precarious. Um, <laughs> and then I'll be honest. The other thing is when you're sitting next to a propane burner all day long, you're talking over that noise the whole time. You're breathing in some of that. Having the electric is just, I think, personally, just so nice. Um, I agree too. And that's a sign that we're getting old is when we're, we're it too, talking over the sound of a propane burner is too much for us. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to No, It's a little loud in here, honey. I should just really sit. But it's here. okay. Now you don't have to say brings the young man's game. It's like, yeah, you can do it that way. And when you don't have enough money to afford this, like, okay, a Braumeister used to be the only way you could do that. Right. Right. The Braumeister started two grand, two and a half grand, uh, blah, blah, blah. Now these little old ones are under 500. And it's like, okay, it's, it's just this access to um, different, you know, obviously competition drives down prices too, but access to different manufacturers and, and this kind of stuff. And it's like, and you would think at the five, nine, or four, the, the, the Bruzilla, it's, it's 499. You would think, oh, that thing's gonna be a piece of garbage. Um, actually, I lied, it's, it's now, um, Three ninety nine, um, and it's it's what I brew on. <laughs> it's easy. It's programmable. The programming is a little different. I got a whole page dedicated to it towards it. But uh, once you get to know it, I, I use it mostly to just preheat water at the time I want it hot. Um, so you know, I have kids now. I wake up early and I want to brew <laughs> before soccer starts or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. I can have that water, that mash water, ready to go first thing in the morning. Um, but that's just luxury. I mean, things we just didn't have. Uh, right. Yeah. The space has really grown. I love the Brusilla, by the way. Uh, you know, I talk about it all the time on the show, uh, because it, it's, it's sort of like a Pico brew, but it's also hands-on. Like it takes a short amount of time. You can still do stuff, but it has that, you know, added ability to, you have to add in your grains or you have to sparge with that unit and you don't have to, I guess you can just do the, uh, you know, balance out the, the, you know, the amount of water you were going to put in for sparge, add that with your grain, and then you can just add it into the ferment or whatever you can do. Yeah. The BIAB so, method. Yeah. That's cool, man. What yeah, else? So I, that to me is an example of a luxury, even though it's yeah. $400, I still consider that a luxury because it just didn't exist. And it's the type of thing that a lot of people are like, I haven't brewed in years. I got so sick of all the cleaning afterwards and storing all that. And, blah, blah, blah. My life changed. I, I just don't have time. And it's like, then you show them that and they're like, oh yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and that's what I think this conversation is sort of about also is not only what, what damage can you do? Uh, but like you said, uh, you know, it doesn't high end, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, expensive. Um, but it's also like how things have changed over the years. And, and for anybody who hasn't brewed, but maybe you're still hanging on, listening to the shows or whatever, you can still get back into it for relatively cheap. And I know that word means different things to different people, but like you're saying, I mean, what do you think the technology for, for uh, the Brusilla would be 10 years ago? It, it would probably oh, be out of, it'd probably be out of the realm of more people, or it probably wouldn't even be uh, put into production for the most. It part. would be the, it was called a Braumeister. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I'll admit the Braumeister is, you know, a nicer German construction and, and it's thicker metal. And it's, you know, there, if it's like looking at a Toyota versus a, you know, high end BMW or Mercedes or whatever you're into or whatnot, it's just different. Uh, they both like, work. They both get around. Yeah. No, the Braumeister was rad. I still, I still remember brewing on that thing. Yeah. Well, and it's like, uh, other luxuries in my mind, you know, we, we call luxury now, or I call luxury because, you know, hydrometer was it. And if you wanted a refractometer, it's like, whoa, 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 those are like three or $400. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. and now, now hydrometers are like, or refractometers are, are, you know, pretty darn cheap. And I don't know if you've ever seen 
um, the easy dens that we sell now it's $350, but it's, you know, an app on your phone, one drop or a no, little over one drop, but one little tiny sample of the wart. Um, and it, it does everything right to your phone. You can log it, all of that, but you can also get a refractometer for under 40 bucks. So it's like, these are all complete luxury items compared to like spinning a hydrometer and wait, are you reading the top of the line? Are you reading in between the two? Are you, yeah, you got to get that meniscus lined up just right. Well, then it's like, it also used to be like, well, I don't want to own three of these things, hydrometers. So I'm going to get one with a scale of one to 32 within this much range. So yeah. <laughs> and as you get older, it's harder. To... Well, an easy dense is very much a professional thing. The, be the beauty of easy dense is Anton Parse really sells into the commercial brewery world. Yeah, and, and they sell great units, but they're I think typically four or five grand minimum for these, you know, equipment. They basically use the same tube. That's the magic little like tube that the liquid goes through, mm -hmm. and then did a board that was a little less expensive and such, you know, to be able to to produce this item. Um, and they don't want to hear this, but we've been told by breweries that sometimes they find it cheaper to buy. The, each one of their brewers, one of these and an iPad than it is to buy a fleet of the nice. Uh... Well, you know, that'll happen also. With innovation comes uh, ways around high prices. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, in those spaces, you know, the, 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 the quality is definitely there. Chris, let me take one last break, man. I'm really sorry. Absolutely. I cut you right off, but uh, I just want to make sure I get everybody in here. So hang on, everyone. It's the session. We'll be right back um, after, uh, after I figure out what I'm saying. We're almost done here with the homebrew topic uh, for this uh, nice session here with Chris Graham from More Beer. And we were talking easy dens, talking high-end equipment, um, just talking, I guess, essentially innovation in the space of homebrewing and, and what uh, how things have changed. This is very much a back-in-my-day conversation. <laughs> like, back in my day, I had to pinch my fingers on whatever, but now robots have nanobots to do everything and i just sit back um i wish that would be uh that would be very cool but uh what else can we look forward to if we want to sort of trick out our home brewing or 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 upgrade or even get back into the game honestly because i think there are some people out there like me who have struggled with that well for me like one of the last things is you know anyone who really loved the hobby and got into um kegging converted a fridge at some point right they mm -hmm. made a, i hate the word keezer no, um, that is the worst word dude no keggle is the worst word keys is my second worst <laughs> word but, yeah but anyway they made their own uh, test freezer we used to have one in the back of the shop you mm -hmm. know that darren's brother or olin's brother made and with you know taps all over it and everyone's made one old fridges taps through the door blah 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 it was yeah. like, ooh, I want to do a kegerator. And, you know, for a long time, we still actually sell true kegerators. No, we used to sell true kegerators, the brand true, which is like what you see at a bar or whatnot, because they're like commercial grade kegerators. And I have one in my backyard and those things retail for over a grand, you know, even more. And then, then you put in your draft stuff afterwards. Um, and now it's like we sell these Comos kegerators and it's like, the, the basic home interior ones are, uh, you know, they're five to $700, maybe a little bit more here or there, depending on how you're outfitting. They'll do, they'll hold four homebrew kegs and one kegerator on wheels. Wow. Um, which is pretty amazing. Tank? Where's the, the CO2 tank? Uh, you know, on that? the back on a little mount. And it has oh, wow. like a place. It, it, these guys thought of it all. Like it's all thought out in terms of, Oh yeah, the, there's a thing that you can break through on the fridge that you screw onto, and the CO2 goes right through without leaking. Um, Get out of yeah. town. And, and and you know, I switched over a couple of years ago to these duo type fittings, and it's like I used to have gas leaks all the time, and uh, you know, I'd sit there with my hose clamp and clamp it down, cutting my hand half the time because it slips yes. off the. I have. I have scars on this knuckle right here from not only doing that in draft systems, but putting those draft systems together, by the way, that's a work, that's a work injury. Um, <laughs> I think, I think your uh, 
I don't know, the rid of habeas no. corpus or whatever. <laughs> this is far expired at this point. I don't know. My finger doesn't stop doing this. I can't. Anyway, yeah, those things are vicious, man. Yeah. So anyway, we we now just use where you just you have the hose and you just push it in, pull it out a little bit, and it just locks and it doesn't leak and it's awesome. Um, so I've retrofitted awesome. everything to duo tight now. Duo tight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and now we we just started carrying uh, as of this week or last week, uh, Como's double wide kegerators. So literally, you could fit eight kegs in them, uh, two towers. Uh, it's just ridiculous, wow. and that's that's fifteen hundred bucks. Like for eight, ke- I mean, you could run a small brewery off of these things. Well, and what the the good part about those is, I remember. Um... I don't know, uh, 2005 or so, I moved into the house in Concord and I wanted a chest freezer. And back then, I haven't looked in a while, but there was, uh, anyway, it died. But I, I got it off of uh, Craigslist. Yep. And there was a moment in time where you could do that. But then after that died, I looked online and looked online and kept looking for months and months and they were just, they were gone. Either they were being taken up before I could grab them by people who wanted to do chest freezers and stuff like that, or just for, you know, prepper. I don't know what was going on, but you couldn't find them anymore. So then they had to get like a stand up fridge and convert it. And those are much more of a pain in the ass because if you're drilling through the side, which normal, any human being would do, maybe the coolant is in this side. So you don't really know it's very hard and it, it's, it's costly because you're sitting there doing all that stuff. And that's, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get at with all this is, what can we do to limit the amount of work because we're all aging out of being able to do you know, homebrew work at home? <laughs> you know well, what I mean? And with our, we're getting old, we, we, we like things to look decent. And this looks like a professional kegerator. I mean, it's, it looks like a, something that belongs in a bar, not something that belongs in the dark basement that nobody should see under dim lighting. You know, my first, one of my first chest freezers had half a dead deer still in it when I got it out of Craigslist. <laughs> did you keep the deer <laughs> uh, it was all like it had been sitting warm for a while so it was uh, quite nasty <laughs> are you sure it was a deer <laughs> oh god forensic yeah. files wasn't around back then it's funny because like i have two kegerators they one of them mostly stores beer but they uh, both of them basically just have food in them now it's just that's sort of where we're at right now. But I feel oh, yeah. like something like this, you couldn't do that. You're not going to be like, oh, here's like four apples in this kegerator because I have other kegs. Like, it's never going to be overrun. Where can, can you get it? Is that a, a more beer thing? Like, can oh, you have of a course. Beer? Okay. Yeah. And then we sell these really high end, like nice ones that are all stainless. I mean, I say all stainless. I mean, all stainless. Interiors, the floor of them, everything is stainless. Does the the other ones or the other one the entry level I guess does that have stainless on it too? It sounds like it, it does. has some like stainless. I, I I'm gonna check real quick. I think the floor is stainless, which is really nice. Yeah. Uh, but the rest of it is plastic, and then the door is like a stainless look to it. Okay. Um, and the faucets and stuff. Oh yeah, those are all the the nice inner tap uh, forward ceiling faucets and everything. And that's another thing too, man. I remember when forward ceiling faucets sort of like hit the homebrew market. It was oh a, yeah, it was a big deal. That that I mean, just talk about. Remember when it, you used to go to a tap and you'd pull on it and it'd just be like sticking, and you don't know how much. Like I'm just gonna rinse this thing um, and rip things apart uh, to get it, and yeah. then you're just thinking how nasty that like open air spot in the front of that faucet is just sitting there well, with and, flies. And it's like, I never really knew that until the forward ceiling faucet sort of came and they shone a light on it and you're actually like cleaning it. Like, oh, okay. Cause I've snapped that, that bar before. Cause it was just brass, you know, yep. I'm not super strong, but like sticky beer has a, a, a pretty, uh, what a tensile strength, I guess. I don't know. It's sugar. I mean, essentially it's drying sugar. And so I don't know if you remember this, but we used to sell a replacement I forget what that piece is called, the lever. We used to sell a replacement that was made of stainless so that, right. uh, so that it wouldn't snap on you. <laughs> so you just bend your faucet frame instead of that. <laughs> no, you'd rip the refrigerator door usually. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, that sounds cool, man. Um, there you go. High-end homebrew. So we can, High-end uh, homebrew for a low cost. And that's right. Yeah, and that's really what it is, man. High-end homebrew. Some good innovation coming out of there, too. Um, so anybody looking to get back into homebrewing, which you should, honestly, because it's a lot of fun, 
um, you know, hopefully we gave you a couple ideas, a couple two tree ideas, or if you, you're looking at upgrading, uh, prices are not as bad as they were. If you've been around this, this homebrew for a while, uh, you probably like me and you think that everything that says the word stainless in it is going to automatically be just out of your price range. But I think a lot of things have, have changed, uh, in addition to the new products coming out. So, uh, definitely check it out. Chris, thanks, man. I'm glad, uh, you got your heart rate down from your Whitney, uh, hike. I'm glad it was successful. And I'm glad you made some drinkable beer. I'm assuming it's drinkable, right? Absolutely drinkable. I mean, I'm not going to call it the best beer I've ever made, but yeah. quite drinkable. Okay, good. And then uh, you did also say that you guys um, are putting more videos on your YouTube channel. Yes. Okay. What what kind of stuff do you guys have over there? I naked shows. Uh, no. Uh, Eat um, all the time. Definitely trying to work on, um, and this is kind of an intro, like this is hopefully kind of getting to know Olin and I a little bit better because we, we try to do talks like every time we camped, we, we sat down and talked and just to get to know our history a little better, get to know some more employees, uh, maybe have some more technical stuff with, with Colin and um, Vito, but mostly products. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's mostly about product launches and releases. And there's so much more you can see in a video than still pictures. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, and that's where all the information is. That's where people are going first. Yeah. Because you're watching a video. I know every time I Google like how to do something or even information on stuff, it's just, I mean, of course it's Google. They're going to throw YouTube at you first, but like the first five results are always videos. Well, and it's I like my, my kids, this generation of kids growing up now, and I didn't get it when my kids were, you know, three or so or four, but nowadays it's YouTube. It's, it's, uh, and it's funny. It's like, I only use YouTube to learn how to fix the car or the fridge. Like I didn't know <laughs> we use YouTube for entertainment. That's weird to me. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Like on my, uh, on my Disney podcast, ears up podcast.com, everybody. Um, you know, I'll ask like my friends like, oh yeah, who should we have on? Like, oh, this person's a, a Disney tuber and a Disney vlogger. This and like the, I had no idea for a while those even existed. People just go to the parks and like walk around and like they get 50,000 views. You're like, I, how? Well, I, I hate to admit this, but my, as a treat, I bought my kids Mr. Beast burgers on Saturday night. Um, I don't know what that is. You don't know what Mr. Beast is? Oh, you're, Alice isn't old enough yet. No. Um, he's a famous YouTuber. And he did a very smart thing. He franchised out his burgers. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't own thousands of restaurants. You can get the app, MrBeastBurger.com, and they have like the main stars, like uh, his and the other guy and the other guy, and shows you how much I watch. <laughs> I am now sounding really old. The other guy, <laughs> those other, oh, it has that guy in it. He's good. <laughs> but then you go to pick it up, thinking you're going to like show up to a McDonald's or whatnot. No, it's a boba tea place on Clayton Boulevard, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> who just pays his license fee. And you can charge outrageous amounts of money for a hamburger. And I'm sure they get a cut, you know, they, they charge the base part and he probably just gets a royalty for it. That's dude. People who have figured out how to game the system are, are just, that's genius to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much to our sponsor, More Beer. Go to morebeer.com, of course. And to everybody else you heard throughout this show, we really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. And until next time, we'll see you later.